the awe and wonder of Christmas is contained in one trenchant, dynamic, triumphant statement of the Apostle Paul. Here is the intellectual, the spiritual, and the emotional basis of a great Christmas. Hear the word of the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. O oh, gracious God, help us to realize the richness of heaven, the wonder of your love and grace, forgiveness, peace, and power, and realize how rich we are because you came in Jesus Christ, our Lord. In his holy name we pray, amen. Last month I sat leafing through a national magazine and got fascinated by the want ads in the back of the magazine. Now, that may seem strange to you, but they were kind of interesting and one in the financial column caught my eye. It said, you can get rich this Christmas. Just allow us to use all of your money for the next 31 days. We'll give you a quick turnaround, and by the end of the month, you'll be rich. Quite an offer. I sat back and began to think uh, the kind of ad I might write. I'd put mine in the life opportunities column, and uh, it'd go something like this. You can be rich this Christmas. And the copy that I would write would be like this. There is a father who is looking for people to share an inheritance with his son. He wants people who will claim that they are joint heirs with his son in using an indefatigable inheritance, unlimited love, unqualified forgiveness, nonstop joy, deep inner peace, guidance every day, courage for suffering, hope in the midst of uncertainty, the power to face death, and the assurance of eternal life. All you have to do to qualify for this immense wealth is admit that you're poor, and he'll make you rich. Now, that's an offer for Christmas. You can be rich this Christmas in the only way it makes any difference to be rich. All throughout the New Testament are magnificent reminders that heaven is filled with richness. Christ came to share that richness, and you and I can be spiritually rich in and through him. Never forget talking to a very wealthy multimillionaire in Evanston, Illinois. I had a church nearby in Winnetka, Illinois, and we became friends. During the time I was there, the man accepted Christ as his personal Savior. He began to grow in him. His heart was so full of the love of Christ that he could hardly contain it. One day he was dying. And he asked me to come and see him. He said, Lloyd, I've turned over all of my wealth to my two children. Everything I have is now theirs. 
Oh, how I long to be able to share with them the richness of my heart. You know, that was God's problem 20 centuries ago. That was the problem he faced as he and the pre-existent co-equal son looked upon the planet Earth, saw the degradation, the estrangement, the hurt, the pain. And he longed that his people might know all of the power of his love. In the sense, he had to figure out a way to transfer all of the wealth of heaven so that it could be drawn on by the people on earth. Christmas is the celebration of an immense transfer of wealth. And you and I are rich because of Christ. The Apostle Paul, in the midst of sharing with the Corinthian church about how they should give and respond to the needs of others, put this one statement, 2 Corinthians 8th chapter, 9th verse, and it's all there, all four points of the compass. It encircles the totality of our faith. John Donne said that God loves us to the end, not just to his end and our end, but that he may love us forever. I want to talk about a circle of love here in this magnificent statement by the Apostle Paul. You know, he said, you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, though he was rich, for your sakes became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And when you understand that, you're ready to really celebrate Christmas. Let's take it in its four magnificent parts. He was rich. Indeed, he was. Co-equal with God. The one through whom all things were made. The word of God, the creative energy of God that brought about all the universes within universes the one who was the guiding, directing spirit of power of the Lord in the midst of Israel's history. The one who shared the glory of God. Remember what he said? Father, give me again the glory that we had before the world began. That's the glory he left. As he saw the need of the world, he was sent by the Father to reconcile the world to himself. And how could you do that except to come alongside, to take part in humanity, to be in flesh? Soren Kierkegaard, a great philosopher and theologian of another generation, told a wonderful parable about a king who fell in love with a maiden in a nearby uh, village. He tried to figure out how he might be able to win her love. He thought of sending her part of his wealth, or sending an emissary to tell about his wealth. And then he thought about the possibility of taking great uh, processions of power into the little village to tell her how much he loved her. But then he was reminded that the only way he could bring love to that woman was to go and live in that village to serve her until she knew him and knew what he was like and would be willing to marry him. Not far from the Old Testament doctrine of Israel, the bride of Christ, the Lord came himself that he might live in the midst of us. He was rich. Oh, he had everything. All power in heaven and earth was at his command. 
but he left the song of heaven. He left the joy of heaven. He left the peace of heaven. And he came and became poor. That's the next step in the circle. Though he was rich, yet he became poor for our sake. Oh, and oh, how he became poor. Think of it. Conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a destitute, humble, poverty-stricken teenage girl, a virgin, born in a cattle stall, wrapped up in rough swaddling clothes and placed in a feeding trough. That's what manger means. When he was under attack, his parents took the money that they got from cashing in gold, frankincense, and myrrh so that they could escape to Egypt. And when they came back, he lived in a humble little town called Nazareth. There he learned a carpenter's trade. And when he began his ministry, he said, Birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He didn't write any books. He didn't lead an army. He preached the glory of heaven, the love and acceptance and forgiveness of God, and he was that to people. There was congruity between what he said and what he was because he was the Son of God. To understand the wonder of Christmas, you need to know that in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the hypostatic union took place between the divine and the human, a perfect blending. Nothing was left out. He was fully human and yet fully divine. And that's why his message cut to the very core of human need but he became poor in the midst. He poured himself out for people. The people who were poor came to him because he identified with them. Broken people felt healed. And then they took him as he shared our human poverty. They ripped his clothes off of him and wrapped up some thorns, and crushed them into his head. The poverty got worst of all as they nailed his hands into a cross, and they raised him up, and he writhed for the sins of the world. The darkest hour of the poverty was between noon and three, when he felt our forsakenness, terrible loneliness and anguish. Oh, my friends, my sisters and brothers, he did that for you and for me. He became poor. so that we could be rich. But we don't experience his richness until we become poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs, theirs is the experience of having their hunger satisfied. Well, what would life be like without Christ? Then we know our poverty. Just think of what history would be without him if he hadn't revealed the love, prevenient grace, forgiveness, redemption, new life, transformation. I want to tell you that as I studied yesterday, I had Christmas. Oh, it's been a busy December. Push and pull. A lot of rush and no hush. And I had Christmas. 
I got so excited as I studied these scriptures yesterday. I could hardly contain myself. I turn to the second chapter of Philippians. Having you this mind which was in Christ Jesus, that though he was equal with God, did not believe that equality was a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. And God has given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven above and on the earth and underneath the earth and declare him Lord to the glory of the Father. You and I are rich because of him. Follow the circle. Identify with that richness. What does it mean to be in Christ and to be rich in him? It means that the riches of glory, that is, the wonder of the presence of the Lord, is ours. The riches of grace, which means that we are loved unqualifiedly. The riches of goodness, that God will always be consistent with you and me. All that's ours. He's just heaped it up in the bank of the spiritual bank of life and said, come, draw on it. It's yours. The apostle Paul said, all things are yours. The world, life and death, the past, future, because you are Christ's and Christ is God's. You're rich. Do you know that? Paul said to the Corinthians, for you know, but I want to know, do you know that? Why then live as a spiritual pauper in the midst of this kind of spiritual wealth? Hmm. Oh, I'm not poor. Now, with Jesus Christ, I'm a joint heir, for he stooped. He came, my poverty, to share. You're rich, dear friend, when you make Christ the Lord of your life, receive his spirit, then you can celebrate Christmas.